Good evening. Welcome to Alpha Ministries live stream. We're beginning the Biblical Self-Awareness Lesson 1 of the Alpha Series. So I want to say greetings, saints, sinners, believers, unbelievers, whosoever will. We're going to, um, for the next few weeks, couple months or so, be studying out the Alpha Series. The author of the Alpha Series is John Glenn. Um, Alpha Ministries is located in Okeechobee, Florida. And it is a, it's it's not your typical um, mainstream institutional church. We work a lot in recovery with recovery circles. We are considered Alpha Ministries a recovery church because what we truly believe is that the whole world is in need of recovery. Okay, the whole world needs Jesus Christ. The whole world needs to be changed. Um, often when someone comes to me for just pastoral counseling, um, they'll usually start off when you want to get their story and gather information from them. They usually start off with a statement like, I come from a dysfunctional family. And I say, well, welcome to the human race. I mean, I, I knew that when you walked through the door because we all are dysfunctional to some degree or another. So what we're going to do in the first part of the Alpha series, the biblical self-awareness, is really try to see ourselves the way God sees us. Okay. Now, um, there's a story about a it's a it's an ancient um, Hindu uh, parable, fable, and it's about this this magician that could grant the wish, any wish of the animal kingdom is in charge of the animal kingdom. So a mouse, a mouse comes and says to the magician, you know, I live my whole life in fear of the cat. So please, can, can you help me out? So the magician says, fine. Boom, changes the mouse into a cat. Now, sometimes later, that's that cat that was a mouse comes back to the magician and says, the dog's out there. The dog's out there and the dog's going to get me. Going to pounce on me. I'm afraid of the dog. I live in constant fear of the dog. So, poof. The magician changes the cat that was a mouse into a dog. Now, soon after that, the dog that was a cat that was a mouse comes and says, there's, there's, a, there's tigers out there in this great land of ours. There's tigers. I'm scared to death. Those things are ferocious. So the magician said, fine. Change the dog that was a cat that was a mouse into a tiger. Well, the magician thought he was done with his work, but it wasn't too much later that the tiger that was a dog, that was a cat, that was a mouse, came and said, I am so afraid the hunter's out there and he's got guns. So the magician scratched his head and says, fine. Boom. Change the tiger that was a dog, that was a cat, that was a mouse, back into a mouse and said, I made you the mightiest of all the beasts in India, but since you think like a mouse, you're better off being a mouse. And that was the end of the story. So what we're going to study out, to give you the end at the beginning, we're going to study out in the biblical self-awareness all the things that God has done for us to change us, how God has already changed us. A lot of people that seek recovery are seeking change, and they feel like they can never change. And I always see relief come over the faces of many of the guys in the halfway house when I tell them God has begun the change already. God has changed you already. God's way of changing us is transformation from the inside out. Where man's idea of change is we're going to change ourselves from the outside using external things. And hopefully it changes our inside, changes our hearts. So we're going to start off tonight looking at the question, who are you? 
adolescent psychologists say that in adolescence, that's the period. I mean, there's, I mean, adolescence really isn't an age. It's how you, it's how you develop and progress because there are people in their seventies that are still stuck in adolescence. See, adolescent psychology says that in between really from 12 years old up maybe into your mid twenties, you have to answer four important questions in order to be functional as a human being. And the first question is, who are you? The second question says, what is your purpose? The third is, what do you need? And the fourth is, how do I relate to others? Those four questions. Tonight, we're going to look at the first one. Who are you? What is your identity? What is your self-image? Now, when I ask the question, or people ask you, who are you? There's a lot of things that might go through your heads now that you're thinking, like um, how you would answer that question. If you are, if your name, of course, um, or say you're at a wedding, you usually talk about who you are in relationship to the bride or groom. I'm a friend of the bride. I'm a friend of the grooms, right? So th there's that. Or you might answer with your profession. You know, I'm a counselor. I'm a teacher. I'm a truck driver, and it goes on and on. So there's various ways that we identify ourselves. But those are all external things. Those are all does not get to the core. And we all have our own self-image that is different, really, from, from maybe our true self, who we really are. We all have a self-image. So we're going to start there before we discover who God has made us to be, how do we? How does our self-image develop and where do we get to where we find ourselves of how we think about ourselves? Now, Carl Rogers was a behaviorist, and we know that behaviorists, they study behavior. They really study why we act weird. And he said that it had a lot to do with self-image. He said the first thing that comes into play for anybody's self-image is how other people see you. Okay, now this usually starts right in our immediate family. We're born into the family, and as children, we get direct messages and indirect messages from our parents. Okay, direct messages could be verbal. I love you. You're special. You're wonderful. Okay, indirect messages could be that, you know, the parent spends time or is affectionate. Spend, spends time with you, is affectionate. As you grow and develop, an indirect message could be the parent gives you certain tasks to do and really believes that you're able to do them. Okay, direct messages as, as we grow could be parents encouraging words. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times, and I don't want to gang up on parents here because they probably mean well, they probably want to motivate their kids, but some of the direct messages verbally might not sound that nice. They might say, you're stupid. Well, what the hell's the matter with you? Right? I mean, I, you know, when you, when you do some, some counseling and you sit with people in recovery or trying to change, you hear some pretty nasty things that parents can say or do. Right? And sometimes it's not the best in intentions. It's not to motivate them to do better. You know, like, you know, my dad, he'd say things like, you know, get your head out of your ass or something like that. You know what I'm saying? To demotivate me, get going, get moving, right? Now, those, those direct messages, unfortunately, hurting people hurt people. There's hurting people and they say things that hurt. And then people begin to develop a very negative self-image. Now, because of our inheritance in Adam, right? Because of the fall, we're naturally afraid of God, and our tendency is to, to run from God, and our tendency is always to think, when we think in terms of God, that we're not good enough. That's just, that's just, that's, that's the inheritance that we have from a sin-cursed world and in sin-cursed bodies. Now, think about that, direct messages and indirect messages. You know, growing up, um, it was discovered later in my life, we all figured it out, my parents and everybody else, um, is that I, I, I broke a lot of my toys. I broke a lot of things. 
And one of the reasons is I, I was coming up in the age of electronics and there was all these new things. I wanted to see how they work. So I wound up breaking them. And I got the nickname Fat Fingers. They call it Fat Fingers, breaking things again. And then my mom, I heard her say in front of my aunts and uncles a few times in, in adult talk. I, I know I heard it at least twice. Ah, Billy, he's not mechanically inclined. He's 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 clumsy. He can't, you know, he can't, he's not good with his hands, can't do things. So naturally, I never tried to do anything. Right. But as I grew older and I took some courses and found out about all this stuff, I realized that if I took my time and I really thought things out, I could fix things. I we are the motor of our washing machine went last month and I fixed it. I replaced the motor. Okay. Because I, I thought about it, I used to have to read things. Now you go on YouTube and they'll they'll show you, you know. And the good thing about our technology now is they, like the LED displays for all the dishwashers and things, they give you an error code. They tell you what's wrong with it. So anyway, I digress. So now an indirect message and, and my mom, we, we talk about this, so I'm not, we, we laugh about it now, is that my mom used to give, she would tell me to do something, and I was a slowpoke, and my mom's very efficient. And then she'd go, put get out of the way, get out of the way, you're not doing it right, get out of the way, let me do it. So that was an indirect message that I, you know, that I can't, can't do things. So anything tactile or kinesthetic growing up, I always shied away from it. You know, maybe that's why I, you know, got into singing and music and books and English. I'm an English teacher, right? But anyway, so these, this is the way that we develop a self-image. So you have how others see you in your immediate family, but then you grow up in the culture, right? Whatever culture you grow up in. Okay, I grew up in a culture where boys, you know, boys and men did not cry. You know, so if you felt like crying, you thought, man, something's wrong with me. I'm a sissy. I'm this... You know, so it's not only it's not only the nuclear family, then it's your culture. And then when you get into, you know, into middle school, which is friggin purgatory, you get into middle school, you know, the messages start getting louder. Right. And and in our in our culture, we usually equate beauty, especially for females with youth and weight. Right. You know, I have a friend like he'll tell his wife, he'll say to his wife, oh, honey, you're beautiful. And she'll say, oh, I gained weight and this and that. And he'll say, I didn't say you were skinny. I said you were beautiful. Right. Or, oh, I got wrinkles. I'm getting gray hair. I didn't say you were young. I said you were beautiful. See, that's so in our culture, we have all these bombardments. Right. To tell us how other people see us. Right. Will give us messages about ourselves. Now, with that, so and then you have your natural, you have your natural inheritance from Adam. You have messages that you get your whole life from your culture. And then that begins to play on how you see yourself. So you're already born with a negative view of God and fear of God. And um you know, Richard Rohr says that if we have the right view of God, we'll have the right, correct, correct view of ourselves, right? And they usually take care of each other. So if we can really understand who God is and, and who he's made us to be and how he looks upon us, it would probably solve the whole self-image problem. But notice now that we have how others see us and how we see ourselves, okay? Now, as a... One of the key verses that we use in the beginning of here in the biblical self-awareness is as a man sees himself, so is he. Meaning how you think about yourself is going to determine how you act. And I told you, like when when anything, like when I when I started driving and like if I needed windshield wiper fluid, like anything mechanical, I totally shied away from. And it wasn't because I couldn't do it. It was because I thought I couldn't. I had a bad self-image. I'm clumsy. I break things. I, I better not get involved. Okay. So those two things began to play off of each other. Now, if we were left to just how others see us and how we see ourselves, we're really at the mercy of our own stinking thinking or what others say about us. 
So we're either going to have to get other people to like us and say nice things about us, which could be exhausting trying to keep up with that to make sure no one says anything negative about us. And we have to try to <coughs> really understand what's wrong with us. The what, why do we think and believe the things we do about ourselves? But there's a third thing here. See, we're not left just to, to, to how others see us and how we see ourselves. There's this third part, which is the way you really are, the third circle on the top. The way you really are or the truth about you, the truth about who you are. And this is where we really want to focus in on that third circle. You see, that third circle is what God says about us, what God says is true about us, that third circle. Now, right off the bat, if you're new to the gospel, if you're new to a relationship with God, if you're, if you're new or whether you're not new, there are things about you that are true that are absolutely true in the spiritual realm that you haven't believed yet, that you haven't discovered yet, that you haven't realized yet. You follow me on that? There are things about you that are true that you have not yet discovered. For example, how much weight can, your, can, can a square inch or a square foot of your bones hold? Do you know that? Let's see. Oh, that's not it. No. Oh. The human bone is so strong that a block of bone the size of a matchbox can support nine tons. Did you know that about yourself? I bet you didn't. Do you not know and make it not true? No. See, I'm using things in the physical realm to show you that right now, to, to really drive home that right now, there are things about you that are true in the eternal realm. They're true from God's point. They're true about you in, in the eternal realm outside of time and space. Eternal truths outside of time and space are true about you. And you haven't figured it out yet. It hasn't been revealed. You haven't believed it. But nevertheless, they're true. Let's look at some couple other physical characteristics just for fun. When you're simply awake, your brain generates enough watts to turn on a light bulb. No wonder why they always have that thing in the cartoon where bing, right? So I didn't know that, but now I do. The average number of thoughts that humans are believed to experience each day is 70,000. Our lungs inhale over 2 million liters of air every day without even thinking. So all these things are true. You didn't know them, but they're true nonetheless. That's the point I'm driving home. 75 to 100 trillion cells in the human body. All right, so what we're saying then is the way you really are, are there are things that are true about you, spiritually, intellectually, spiritually, outside of time and space, there are things that are true about you that you're going to discover in this study that really will blow your mind. But just because you didn't believe it or think about it doesn't mean that it's not true. So what we're asking you is to lock in and to believe the truth of the gospel. So let's continue. Now, look at the circles. The further apart your circles are, meaning the greater the difference between how we see ourselves, how others see us, and how we really are, the greater the inner turmoil and dysfunction in our lives. Right? The further our circles are apart, the greater the dysfunction in our lives. For example, the greater the turmoil. Say, just, just picture someone that's in addiction. So someone that's in addiction is, is really thinking delusionally. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't have a problem. Everybody around them is looking at them and saying, man, this guy has a problem. And then they don't want to be around the person. And they're saying, I don't have a problem. I can quit anytime I want, blah, 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 right? So that creates a lot of turmoil, a lot of dysfunction. Because deep down, too, they're trying to, to, to hide. They're trying to fool. They're trying to live a lie. And that gets exhausting. So the greater the, greater the difference. Joe Frazier, one of the greatest boxers of all time, he said, 
you know how when you get right before the fight, you stare each other down and you're psyching each other out and you don't want to look away? He said, I used to pray. He goes, I used to stare straight ahead and pray that nobody would look at my knees because my knees were shaking. He looks real tough, but, man, he said, my knees were shaking because I knew in most fights, especially the as I, as I went on, you know, it was with Ali and Foreman. He says, most fights, even if I won, I was going to get hurt. So he, so he, he, there was a big difference between how he presented and his knees were shaking. So the greater the difference, the greater the turmoil. Likewise, the closer our own self-image lines up with who we really are, the less inner conflict we experience. <clears throat> I mean, think about it. Don't we like hanging around the people that know everything about us and like us anyway? That means our circles are pretty much together. If they know everything about us, our self-image lines up what they see, what we see and know, and they line up, and, and, and we feel most at home with those folks, right? So we really want to get ourselves together, so to speak. Now, Chuck Swindoll said that in its earliest form, the word peace meant to bind closely together and came to include the whole idea of being bound so closely together with someone or something that harmony resulted. Okay. Now, what we really want to study out in the next few weeks is really how God has bound us so closely to himself that we can have this great, great inner peace and joy and inner harmony and that we can learn to be authentic and learn to live honestly with people instead of running and hiding. Okay. So I'm going to, in a, in a few minutes, I'm going to bring on um, friends of mine and we're just going to have a little discussion about these issues, but I want to one, just introduce this idea that where do we go to find out who are we? Because there's so many other things that define us and that we can use to define us. Where do we go? Okay. Well, we look at, first of all, what is traditionally called the fall. Okay. The fall tells us how sin and death entered the world and why we get and become dysfunctional. If there's a perfect, beautiful God that created us, why is there so much dysfunction and turmoil in, in my life alone, yet alone the world. So we go to the scriptures, and then we look at God's answer to the fall and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we want to lay the foundation, okay, and look just scripturally at who we are, okay? I want to just off the bat say that we are body, soul, and spirit, and we're going to look at those components quickly okay the physical structure of man is our physical body those are the physical nature the cells tissues organs dna body systems psychochemical reactions all of those things about our physical features we sustain the physical body by food air water um, clothing and shelter in the colder climates okay so we are we are definitely physical beings okay God made us physical beings. We were meant to live physically in physical bodies. We weren't meant to just be spirits that float around. And eternal life is not just spirits floating around. We are going to be physical beings in physical bodies. So that's the physical nature. Now, the psychological nature is what is traditionally called the soul. That's our per perceptions. That's where our personal needs are met and realized. Uh, our psychological uh, is our emotions, our conscious and our subconscious minds. Okay, the soul, the soul structure of man is mind, emotions, and will. Where originally God wanted to teach our minds, control our emotions, and direct our wills. Okay, so that is the, the soul. And then there's the spiritual part of man, 
where God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And our spiritual nature is our creativity, our moral consciousness, our abstract thinking, our ability to communicate. That's the spiritual component of the man. I'm going through this quickly because we're going we're gonna to come back to it and spend a lot of time. Now, some people believe that the soul is really the interaction between the body and the spirit and that we are really just body and spirit and this soul part in the middle is, is really a result of the interaction of those two things. It, uh, to me, it doesn't matter. We, we, we're body, soul, and spirit. Now, looking at the account, in the garden, I would rec I would recommend a book. There's a book by Peter Height, and it's called um, Peter Height wrote a book. It's called Time, Space, and the Creation of You, and it really talks about the opening chapters of Genesis in a, in a light that really opens up your eyes to the fact that um, we can't put God in a box with with anything, and the fact that He's created the universe, right? And he created that huge 156 million billion light years, whatever it is, universe, and he created the littlest individual cell and the DNA. Um, it's amazing. And it's amazing when you look at the, the creation account through everything that we've discovered in the last, you know, in the space age, in the last hundred years or so, um, it really is amazing what's what's out there and and what God is capable of. Now, God. All right, well, let's back up. So, God, the, the scriptures teach that first of all, in Colossians, it says nothing was made without Jesus Christ. Nothing was made without God. That's been made. You know, he's the creator of all things. Nothing was that, that has been made was made without God. So God created the heavens and the earth. And one of the things that Peter Hyde points out is that we usually look at this like he created the heavens and the earth all at one time. But we don't know that. He created the heavens, the universe, and the earth is part of that. So like the, the Big Bang Theory, which has pretty much been proven, and here's the thing, all the cosmologists, everyone, everybody that studies the origins of the universe, that study cosmology, the cosmos, all of them believe in God. That's not, that's not known or, or publicized or talked about a lot. But back in 1994, the Hope Telescope figured, they figured that they pinpointed the origin of the universe that the universe is expanding, it's continuing to expand, and they look at everything that's out there, and there's there's intelligent design. Now, when they made this discovery, in countries in countries in the UK and Europe, it was on the news for weeks, weeks and weeks. I didn't read about it till about 20 years later, and they said when it was on the news for weeks in other countries. It got about a 10-minute segment at 1130 at night on Nightline with Tom Brokejaw or one of those guys, right? So they 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 didn't give it much credence, but um, Hugh Ross in his book, The Creator of the Cosmos, says there is there's really no atheist amongst the scientists that study cosmology, right? So one of the things that Peter Hyde points out is that as the universe expanded, the heavens are created, the earth how to take form, and it was formless and void, it says, and the Spirit of the Lord hovered over it and then brought life onto the earth. And there's nothing about it that says that there are one sequential day. He didn't create the sun, which we measure one day by into what? The third or fourth day. So the way God did all this is amazing. Think of God as the perfect scientist he like he, science is god science is his mind he's the master scientist the ultimate scientist it's mind blowing when you think about these things so god talks about that he created adam he created man and there's two different accounts okay there's first it talks about him creating adam adam naming the animals and then god looking at adam and saying it's not good that man should be alone 
and then he created male and female. He created them. It wasn't, it wasn't that God said, I think I'll create Adam, and then I think I'll create Eve. He had this all planned. For his purposes, he set it up and reports it the way he does because when he says it's not good for man to be alone, he wasn't talking about that Adam was lonely without God. He was talking about that Adam needed to take the love God was pouring into him and give it out relationally. So this was the God's plan from the beginning, male and female, he created them. But it shows that he made Adam, fellowshiped with Adam, and then for his purposes that he intended from the beginning, he made women, <coughs> he made woman, he made the woman Eve. And here's the account. It says he took part of the man's sides and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the part he had taken out of him, the man, and he brought her to the man. Okay, so God God made Adam and Eve, and it says that, so he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So here you see God's purposes, man, woman, and offspring. Okay, and we see the relationship there the relationship of the trinity that mirrors god okay so we're getting into the creation account a little bit tonight we're going to pick up on the creation next week but i wanted to look at biblically at the body soul and spirit part that we were physical beings right and then god breathed breathed into our nostrils and we became a living being he put his breath in us his life in us now, knowing that, knowing that, first of all, we are created by an intelligent, loving God, slow to anger, compassionate and loving, knowing that we were created should mean a whole lot to us. Okay, we should meditate on that. We should think about it. Unfortunately, many of our kids are taught these days, if they're if they're not taught by their parents or the parents, this idea of there's no God and this all happened by chance. And a student said it so well to me once, years ago. Well, according to evolution, Mr. Lloyd, I came from nothing and I'm heading towards nothing. So I came from nothing and I'm heading towards nothing. What is this middle part? Sometimes I feel like it's nothing. <laughs> so that's that's a pretty poor self-image to right away before you even do anything. So what we're going to touch on tonight is we're going to kind of look at how, talk about and discuss how um, our self-image is developed and how that fuels and how that fueled our addiction and then the way back to developing a, a healthy self-image, right? Because what we really want to look at and find out about is the truth of who we are. And we're going to study that out and prove it the next few weeks. But just right off the bat, you can say tonight that you're loved by God, you're accepted by God, you're completely forgiven by God. God loves you, accepts you, forgives you. He demonstrated his love and that Jesus Christ died for you. And God want, God really has, has made this relationship with him a very intimate and personal one. So hold on to that now. We're looking at how the problems really develop and how a poor self-image um, fuels our dysfunction and the way back to a proper self-image. Now, on the panel tonight, we have in the right-hand corner next to me, that's David Currington. Down the bottom is Jim Hutchinson of Hutchinson Upholstery, <laughs> Coast. And we have Pam Herman. And um, like myself, we are all in recovery, and we're going to talk about our self-image um, We'll start with Dave. I guess we'll just go around the clock here 
And uh, Dave, if you want to share how, you know, understanding how your self-image developed and how, whether a good or bad self-image fueled your, your addiction and, and recovery process. Unmute. Unmute Dave. I unmuted him. I, I, okay, sorry. Uh, thank you all for letting me be a part of this class. I really appreciate it. This, um, this teaching, the whole series is incredibly important to me and it's meant a, meant a whole lot in my life, changing my life. <clears throat> so personal self-image, coming from my past, as Bill, you so you know, eloquently laid out the, you know, the way I felt about myself, my self-image was related to, you know, input from my parents, input from my brothers, input from my, the friends that I had. And um, so it was pretty tainted. Some certain things that I went through as a youth, I, one particular thing I had a, very young in kindergarten I had a teacher conference meeting with my mom and my aunt and my kindergarten teacher and i was there with them and they they announced the kindergarten teacher announced that i had, that i wasn't learning at the rate of other kids in, in kindergarten and that they needed to keep me another year well i overheard that whole conversation and so i my self-image at that point was, like Bill put, I felt like I was dumb. I couldn't learn like other people. And uh, that thing at five years old it affected me all my life. <clears throat> so as I believed that I was stupid and I couldn't learn. And so that affected me through school, my whole time through school. And, and when I, the career I ended up with in, in was working with my hands because I never believed I had the ability to do anything other than that. And, but I had some ability with my hands. So that's what I did. So that self image that was created by an outside source tainted my whole life. Um, those are real to me today. They're very tangible. And then in a little further along in school, you know, I really wanted to be involved in sports, but I was at two left feet. I was very non-athletic, uh, didn't have any kind of athletic skills, but that was what I wanted to be a part of. But I couldn't be a part of it because I was looked on as, you know, the least one to be asked to be a part of a, a football team, you know, a little football game. I was the last one called because I didn't have any talent. So that self-image was that I was not able to play sports. I was no good at that. So I had a very poor self-image. I was in reference to that. So I always classify myself as I had no identity. I mm -hmm. didn't know where I fit in. I didn't fit in academically. I didn't fit in in the sports. I didn't have any desire or interest in music anything like that. So I had a very, very, very poor self-image and other people and their image of me was kind of match my image and in, in reference to some of that. So those things affected me severely and, you know, and then starting to learn about this alpha series and this particular, this particular teaching, which is the beginning, opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, that those two aspects of how I see myself and how other people is how what motivated everything I did in life. I wanted to do whatever I was doing, working with my hands to get your approval, to say to me that, yeah, you you do you do nice work with your hands and work, woodworking and what have you. So those became very important. It's what drove me. An inability to react and interact with people because of very, very low self-esteem and low, no identity. You know, I 
on a physical aspect. Bill brought up physical, the physical component of our of the aspect of body, soul, and spirit. I have a body that started off the body I was given. Uh, this is what I say about my disease of alcoholism is I had alcoholism before I ever picked up the first drink. But when I picked up a drink, it lowered those negative self-talk about how I saw myself, how other people saw me. And it gave me the ability to enter into things and took away those fears and the anxieties and stuff where alcohol became my best friend because it relieved that and I could interact with people and I felt like I had some kind of you know it's a false worth and a false identity but it was but the alcohol gave me that that's kind of word you know they use an expression spirits being the alcohol is spirits well <clears throat> for me and I think most alcoholics will will say the same thing that alcohol was worked it helped it took away those <clears throat> those negative things and gave me the ability to enter in. It worked for a season, but then then it turned on us or turned on me, and it started becoming my worst enemy. <clears throat> so I'll kind of leave it there. Just the how other people think of me, how I think of myself, is a driving force that content that I believe. It is in every walking human being in the face of this earth and the uh, the identity that we're about to learn about in these classes will radically change that. And that and Bill touched on this a little bit. When that identity starts being revealed to us of who God has made us to be, there is a peace that passes all understanding. It's the, your that anxiety and that and that um self-talk and stuff starts dying out because you, you start realizing that you are somebody that you are loved you're accepted you have meaning and purpose so i'm gonna stop there thank you yeah, you hit on it you hit on it pretty good you said that you, you basically had had no identity didn't know where you fit in and then eventually we'll, we'll fall into the performance trap i held back on a couple of things this week, because next week we're going to address needs and need your personal needs and your identity are two sides of the same coin. And because um, as I was listening to David talk, you know, that just more and more I see that our worth, our identity are, are just two sides of the same coin. So when we go and start talking about needs next week. We're not jumping on to another subject. We're talking about the same, the same thing. Um, I'm going to bring Pam on. Good evening, Pam. Good evening. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. It's good to be back. Um, as you were talking this evening, I'm going to play a little different role in this, just, I guess, as a, a point of interest. Um, when you were talking about the biblical uh, foundation for the family and the importance of the family, uh, Dave rehearsed his background and upbringing. Mine I was a little different, and I bring this up just to show that it doesn't really make a lot of difference. Um, I had a lot of positive affirmation from my mother and my grandmother, particularly when I was really young. I did not have a strong father positive influence. My father was not a bad person. He didn't hurt me or any, he just basically didn't know what to do with me. He didn't have a, a strong involved father either. So not having the mother and the father influence, but having only the female influence in my life set me up for being much more comfortable around women, but very insecure, and if you would care to use the word codependent in my relationships with men. 
I sought out men who were, the psychological term is emotionally unavailable. And then I would attempt to get their attention to try and meet that need that you'd mentioned earlier um, for my identity. So I had half, but not both pieces. And I think it's important. And it's one of the things that I try and stress for people, um, the importance of the attack on the family that's going on in the world uh, today. You had talked about being in recovery. And as always, I want to throw that piece in. As um, we were looking, you started out talking about um, Carl Rogers. And as I was reviewing, it's made me get out my alpha book. I haven't had this out in a long time. Um, as I was looking at this, the first thing that jumped out at me was exactly what you started with. And that was the uh, paragraphs about um, Carl Rogers and the the images and the set the quote and you had it put up there that said likewise the closer our self image lines up with who we really are and ultimately how others see us the less inner conflict and healthier we become but the greater that turmoil and dysfunction is in our lives and using my word the greater the stress is in our lives. So while addiction is a biological, genetically predisposed chemical imbalance in the brain, it is fueled by stress. So when we have that disconnect between how we see ourselves and how our performance, that causes stress. And when you have a foundation that that's built on from childhood, and in my case, the disconnect really, really started when my behavior, when I was using drugs and alcohol, did not fit that responsible, um, positive self-image that I received from my mother and my grandmother. The big book addresses this specifically, and it doesn't really matter which side of the coin we come from. In More About Alcoholism on page 30, it says, no person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we could drink like other people. And so it recognizes how hard it is for us to live with ourselves when we see ourselves as different from other people and different from our own self image. When we work the steps, um, this is, pretty commonly used in 12 step program that steps one through three restore our relationship with God, which Bill, you said, you know, that's the place we have to start. We don't start on the outside. All the years that I worked in a, a, a treatment program, the first thing everybody wants to do is go out and restore the relationships on the outside before they've done the changes on the inside or their relationship with God. The 12 steps start us specifically with that relationship with God. Then it moves us through steps four through seven in our relationship to ourselves. And then eight through 12, the steps talk about our relationships with others. So a 12 step program falls right into the pattern that God laid out for actual personal change. Granted a 12 step program, particularly as it's practiced today, doesn't have anything to do with who we are in Christ, but at least it does recognize 
the importance of that spiritual connection and the spiritual relationship that has to be established before we can actually move out mm -hmm. to begin a healthy relationship with ourselves or other people. I also just one more comment. I was tickled with the way you were talking about um, the evolution or the evolution, um, if heard people call it, where you believe there's nothing. And I, I've heard it said, and it's my position on it, and that is the more you find out about the way we're fearfully and wonderfully made, harder it is to believe that. I've been in healthcare most of my adult life. And the saying is it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation. Once you know enough about the human body. Thanks. Yeah, very good, Pam. One of the things that, that you talked about on the um, I think most of you know last on January 7th, my dad passed away and I was up in New Jersey and we had a, a memorial service for him. And as I listened to some of the things my sister was saying, I thought, you know, that it, it's typical. You talked about that. You didn't necessarily have negative messages growing up. And um, I always wonder, like, who is there to catch certain people in their lives? So my sister, they spelled her name Patty, P-A-T-T-I. And when she went to school, she had, I think she said, two other girls, and they both spelled it P-A-T-T-Y. And right away, she thought something was wrong with her. And she came, right? You see how we do these things to ourselves? And there was another, so my sister went home, but see, my dad was there to catch it. She said, why did you do that? What, you know, what's wrong? You know, why do I, why are I like the other girls? And my dad picked her up and looked at her in the eye and said, because you're different. You're special. We spelled it that way because you're really special. And so then that, the lies went right out of her head then, you know. I remember counseling, another idea of how we do this to ourselves. There was a, a mom, she brought her son, she, you know, from the church, she wanted me to talk to him and, you know, the parents got divorced. And one of the things he said, as we, you know, he opened up that it's my fault. So I knew and sensed that he said that before and people automatically said, no, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. So I said, well, what did you do? And I went along with him. What did you do? Well, as it turned out, the message he got in his head is when he looked through his mom's photo album, he saw pictures of her mom when she was younger and she was smiling and happy. Then pictures of mom and dad together when they were dating, they're smiling and happy. They get married, they're smiling and happy. He comes along, there are no more pictures of them smiling and happy. So automatically he projected all that onto himself. So there's, you know, we, we have enough with our own minds to deal with, with all the, the other messages that we get from the outside. So I, I was thinking about that when you were talking about your childhood, because, um, you know, I, I watched in horror my, my daughters go through middle school. I thought they would be taught the gospel and never deal with this stuff. And it's just, it's, it's, it's like gravity. So now we have someone new, hasn't been on the panel in any of the classes. Glad to have him here. Jim Hutchinson, um, who's been patiently listening the whole time. Hey, Jim. Hey. Can you so, hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Um, well, I can relate with all of you. Um, my story is a little different. I grew up, from what I remember, um, I don't remember – probably the first seven or eight years. I remember when I was nine and we moved to Florida. Um, but I grew up with, uh, my parents both drank. They were, my mom drank straight vodka. My dad drank straight whiskey. When they weren't drinking, they were the greatest people on the planet. I mean, they were great. But, when they were drinking, they were monsters. So you didn't know, kind of like walking on eggshells, you didn't know if you were going to get hugged or slugged because you didn't know if they were drinking. And um, 
I, I remember some of the things we were taught. Um, you're going to be the death of your mother. Um, you're all just hoodlums. Um, you're never going to amount to nothing. You're going to die in prison like your dad's dad. Um, a lot of negative. Um, I don't really remember a lot of positive in the childhood. Um, but um, so I grew up basically with no identity. Um, I've learned that the first five years in a child's life is the most important. That's when they develop an identity. I, we, me and my two sisters didn't. Um, we kind of always took care of ourselves. The parents, parents were there, but they weren't there. So, but then again, it wasn't all bad. You know, there was a lot of bad, but there was also a lot of good. Um, but needless to say, I, I grew up with no identity, which made me a prime candidate. Uh, I, I ended up being an, an approval junkie. I would be whoever you wanted me to be, just accept me and approve of me. Let me fit in. Because I've never, I mean, even now, I really don't feel like I am like anybody else. I don't really fit in. Um, I've, I've always kind of been a loner. Um, I have a really strong relationship with God, and I'm okay with that. Um, I'm not really... Um, I, I don't talk a lot. I'm I'm really more quiet. Um, I'm a good listener. Um, I, I listen more than I talk. But the uh, approval addiction um, got me into a lot of trouble. Um, I spent I was in and out of jail and trouble a lot. Um, I've been I've Faced 15 years twice and 20 years to life once. And um, uh, the other thing is I, I, the way that I got saved, um, everybody around me was doing it. I don't know, it was back in the 80s. There was some kind of revival movement thing going on, they called it. And everybody around me was getting saved. My sisters got saved, and I'm noticing everybody around me. So it's like, well, if there is a heaven and there is a hell, I damn sure don't want to go to hell. So, yep, I believe. And that's how my journey started. God actually took that then, and he's been working on me ever since. But what's happened is I'm, I've been abused by authority figures. Um, I grew up not trusting anybody. Um, and um, it wasn't until a few years back. Um, actually, it was John Glenn that brought it to my attention. I, I wasn't even trusting God. I thought I was, but I really wasn't. Because of my father-son relationship on earth, I took that to my heavenly father and son relationship. So sooner or later, he's going to turn on me. So you really can't trust him. But I wanted to. I had a desire. And then I also had a desire to change. I was getting in trouble. It wasn't fun anymore. You know, it, it started off fun and it ended up misery. And um, I had a willingness to change, but I didn't know how to make that happen. I went to a few churches um, and I became like religious. And it was all about performance. And, and you know, my dad taught me that uh, my dad was a perfectionist. So he taught me, whatever you do, do it the very best you can. 
So I've always lived under that law system. And, you know, I have, you know, I am, I'm a perfectionist. What I do, the everything that I do, I do the very best I can still. Um, I'm finding the balance in it. Um, but the perfectionism, um, it kind of fueled, uh, I, it kind of makes it worse because uh, when it comes to trying to believe in God, I'm going to perfect the Christian walk or I'm going to try to behave myself perfectly to be accepted and approved. Well, we all know that that doesn't work. And I ended up crashing and burning. Um, it wasn't, it was uh, 1990. God put John Glenn in Alpha Ministries. I heard the Alpha series for the first time. And I knew right then it was the truth. So I started pursuing it. Um, it's been a long, hard journey for me. I'm one of them hard-headed people that don't, you, you could try to tell me, but I really need to experience it for myself before it becomes real. Um, I may come back to you and say, yeah, you were right. Thank you for that. But until I experience it for myself, I really don't trust or believe. So I've actually brought that into my relationship with God. He loves me enough, thank God. I make him prove himself to me because honestly, I'll tell him I don't believe it. I want to believe. I want to, but everything in me won't. It's scared shitless. So thank God that he shows up in my life. He's I've prayed for eyes to see and ears to hear and, you know, mind to perceive and heart to receive. So it's the eyes to see and ears to hear that right there. Um, and I, I've been, I've been praying. Um, you know, I learned that God is love. So I associate pain with love. So I kind of, I, I let it in so far, but then that's it. Cause it's too risky. Um, So I've actually been running from love. Well, really, I'm running from God because God is love. So um, I want to know him. I want him to, to reveal himself to me to where it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, I want to know the love of God that passes knowledge because up here, you think you got it and it's, you know, until you experience it, it, it's just hearsay. You just read it or you heard somebody say it. So, um, God's been showing up in my life. Um, six years ago, um, you know, I ended up getting this house. That, um, everything that I've ever tried to do failed. Um, anything that we, my wife and I invested money in, we lost. So, you know, it wasn't looking good. <laughs> so we lost our house in Okeechobee. It foreclosed because we bought when the market was high back in 05, 07, whenever it was. And, <clears throat> So my chances, we, that was all the money we had, and we lost it. So my chance of ever owning a house was done. You know. Well, come to find out, um, 40 years later, I find out I still have my VA loan. I never used it. Well, I lost it. And the gunny told me when he handed it to me, he looked me in the eye and he said, 
don't lose it because if you lose ever well i lost it it got repoed in one of the cars i was living in so i thought it was gone forever anyway long story short i still had my va loan which the government guarantees down payment whatever so that's how okay it was 40 years later god showed up okay i'm talking to the guy on the phone he takes my name and my social. Oh, yeah, I got you right here. I go, you do? He goes, yeah, you qualify for the max. I go, the max? What's that? 417000 Of course, your income has to, you, you got to be able to, you, your income's got to support that. But that's what the government, because I, I earned it. Okay. Anyway, I thought it was gone. Anyway, I, I get off the phone. I start crying because I just can't believe it. And I heard the Lord say to me, you didn't see that coming, did you? And I'll never forget it. But that was the beginning of God. That's six years ago. Answering my prayer. He's showing up in my life and he's revealing himself. He's opening my eyes to see him and my ears to hear. And that's really what's changing my life. Absolutely. So it's nice to listen to other like-minded because you don't, uh, you go out in the world, you're not hearing it. Or you watch the news, you're not hearing it, you know. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I work by myself most of the time. Um, I kind of have, I'm like, I'm like, um, the silent witness or something it's God puts people I'm telling you he just puts people in my path I, I like it because when I'm telling sharing my testimony or I'm sharing the gospel with somebody else I get to hear it from myself again yeah yeah well, I was taught that the teachers are the most screwed up we need to hear it the most that's why we're teaching it so we can hear it all the time so that's me yeah yeah yeah. Anyway, I'll quit. That yeah, that's why I think God has me teaching it, so I don't forget it. Absolutely. Um, you tied in, you know, one of the things that I, I saw clearly that we all touched on is that when you said that you know you were running from God, you were running from love, when your image of God changed at the same time that your own self-image began to change. And that's one of the things that we're going to, it's going to feed off one another. Series. Um, I'm starting to find out who he's created me to be. And I like that person. <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to like who I am. And that's, yeah. everything is changing now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Good. I just want to, um, before we wrap it up, thank everyone for, for joining in. Um, I like what Dar said here. Um, and that's almost a quote from the upper room in John 13. It said, Jesus knew, you know, where he came from. He knew who his father was. He knew where he was going back to God. The fact that phrase that we're going back to God, that that's very meaningful to me, um, especially at, at, at this point. But um, we had a lot of good participation tonight. Thank you. Tammy for joining in, for Wendy, Glenna, Grandma, Lester, Crystal Sims. Thank you, sweetie, for joining in. We already saw from Bar, Pam. Thank you for joining, Tucker. David, thanks for joining. Sandy, Wendy. Missy, Herman, Herman Ray Hawkins. That's that sounds there was a, a singer screaming Jeff Hawkins. Um, and there's there's Herman's comments. Great authentically thankful for your testimonies about the lives out of the recovery, transforming kingdom labor, which John Glenn showed with Jim Hutch. Awesome, amazing grace alone through faith, the Holy Spirit led changes innermost. Perfectionist. You know, 
we'll end on that note on the idea that we were talking about being perfectionist. Someone told me once, says if, if, if God's made us perfect and we've been made perfect in Christ, we will realize that when we're transformed out of these sin cursed bodies and we're in the kingdom finally forever and ever. But the fact that God's made us perfect, but we're infants, we're perfect, but not mature. He said, trying to be a perfectionist or make yourself perfect, he says, is like going over to the Mona Lisa and trying to touch it up with your own. <laughs> the, the artists, the art experts would kill you. If you had the real Mona Lisa on the wall and you went over there and said, huh, I'd like to change a few things. You know, it's like trying to put a mustache on a Mona Lisa if you're trying to protect yourself. And um, another insight on that, I'm, you know, someone told my wife, Carrie, you're too much, you know, with Bill, that you love him. And, you know, you know, don't, isn't there anything you don't like about him? And she said, sure, there's, there's, there's things. No, isn't there anything you would change about him? She said, well, you got to look out for that. She said, if I change things I don't like, there might be this shift and the things that I really like might go away too. So you never know what God's doing with us. We look at other people think, oh, they need to change. I need to change. It's a process. He's changing us from the inside out. So until then, until he brings about the change that you desire, remember his grace is sufficient, his power is made perfect in weakness, Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you all for joining us. Be back here next Thursday at 7 o'clock, and we're going to continue. We're going to look at the flip side of identity needs. Pam, you got an announcement? Not right now. Thank okay. you. All right. And uh, for the REACH people, you're on the causeway at 9 a.m. Sunday, and Alpha Ministries Church, Freedom Ranch, Church in the Woods is – Alive and well, rolling 11 a.m. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Good night. And see you.